Hello guys. Um, <clears throat> so today we are going to do the scalp and anterior face, but I've decided to divide the lesson into two because the anterior face on its own it's 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 pretty long. So just to cut it short and to make it easier for you to understand whatever we'll be doing, I'll do the scalp lesson now and then either later today or tomorrow. I'll upload another lesson um, about the anterior face. So without wasting time, because I want this lesson to be very short, and I'll try by all means to make it as simple as I can. So as we know, the scalp, we all know where the scalp is. So what you, you have to know, or what we are required to know from this lesson, is by the end of this lesson, you should know the borders of the scalp, the layers, the arterial supply, the venous drainage, and the innovation of the scalp. That is all you have to know about the scalp, and then that will be it. And then you'll forgive me for, for this busy screen, but don't mind anything that is happening. Just go with the mouse. I'll tell you where to focus. Leave everything else. We do everything by the end of this, and you'll understand. So without wasting time, guys, what we know is that, um, as I said, the first thing you have to know is the borders. So the, with the borders of the of the scalp, your scalp is from posterior. It starts from the superior lines and from the external occipital protuberance. We all know where that is. It's this pointy thing here, but it's in your skull, obviously. And then you have your superior lines about that level. So your skull starts there, right? And then it goes all the way to your frontal bone. But in your frontal bone, to be specific, right about the region, just above that region where your hairline starts. Yeah, where your hairline starts, that, 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 that is where your, your scalp starts, right? And then laterally, it goes to the level of your zygomatic arc, right? So those are the borders of the scalp right here. Anteriorly is the line of your hairline. Where, where your hairline starts, that's where the scalp, the scalp starts anteriorly. Laterally, it ends at the level of the zygomatic arc. Posteriorly, your superior lines and your external occipital protuberance, protuberance right? We are sorted with the, with the borders. And then with the, when it comes to the layers, the scalp, the mnemonic scalp itself, it can help you to remember the, the the layers of the of the scalp. So the scalp has five layers. It has the skin, the connective tissue, the aponeurosis, the loose areole, and the periosteum. As I listed them there for you. So when it comes to your skin, your skin has. We know that the skin has two layers. You have your epidermis, you have your dermis, and then we can further divide it to the hypodermis. But that is not important in this section. What you have to know is that the skin has the sebaceous glands, right? And since it has most sebaceous glands, it is the common site for sebaceous cysts. So the sebaceous cysts, if you don't know what sebaceous cysts are, just go to internet search. I couldn't, I couldn't put a photo or an image of a sebaceous cyst because as you can see, this screen is messy already, guys. So that is all you have to know with regards to your skin. And then with your connective tissue, to be more precise, because you know that Connective tissue is very broad. So the connective tissue we are talking about here is the dense connective tissue. So what you have to know about the dense connective tissue here of the scalp is that it is highly, highly vascularized and it is highly in innovated. And um, it has its blood vessels um, that are inherent to the connective tissue itself. So what do I mean? that the blood vessels are tightly bound to the connective tissue itself, that they can't constrict because they are tightly bound. So this is an area that is um, more exposed to profuse bleeding, are we clear? So it's, it's, well, it's an area that can bleed like profusely, if you know what the word means, it can bleed a um, lot amount of blood in simplest terms. So 
what's the reason behind it um pleading or lose um being capable of losing a lot amount of blood which is not a good thing obviously but what i what you have to understand is that it won't undergo what we call bone acronesis right meaning that um it's the death of the cell of the bone right because of the loss of blood because you know blood brings oxygen and everything it won't undergo that because most of the blood the major major supply is from the middle meningeal artery so meaning that un unless the middle meningeal artery is the one which is damaged, which which is damaged we can have bone chronosis here are we clear awesome we yes we will have a lot of blood loss and everything because and it is an area which has a lot of anastomosis if you still remember what anastomosis is right so meaning that if we cut if we can cut one blood vessel it will not only bleed on one side because if it's something like this if this is your blood vessel if we cut it here since it's anastomosis meaning that there are many blood vessels that are coming to that very same point if we cut it here this is bringing blood this is bringing blood another one is bringing blood so hence there will be a lot of bleeding i hope that makes sense guys if it doesn't let me know i'll explain it further and then going to the aponeurosis aponeurosis is a tendon like structure it connects here in this case to be precise this is just not any aponeurosis eh? the name of this aponeurosis is epicranial aponeurosis so this epicranial aponeurosis connects what your frontalis and your occipitalis muscles so it it overlies the parietal bone are we clear so that is another reason why um the connect the scalp is the area that leads profusely the reason is the aponeurosis is very tight right so it's it's like it's stretching and pulling the the frontalis muscle and the occipitalis muscle together so the moment your your, um, your blood vessel is is cut that simply it's like it's splitting apart it's it's not easier for it to be um to be constricted i'm clear guys i hope you understand and then going to the next layer which is the fourth layer we have our loose areola our loose areola is also a connective tissue you, you remember and then what you you have to remember to know here is that it also contains blood vessels but more importantly what's special about this or the most important thing about it it's nothing special the most important thing about it is that it's the dangerous area of the scalp it's the dangerous area of the scalp why is it a dangerous area of the scalp because here is where the infection and the pus you know what pus is like right? that whitish stuff so the the pus and um, infection spread easily and quickly in this um layer of the scalp and the reason being you have what we call emissary veins i'm going to explain what emissary veins are and i'll show you you have what we call emissary veins which connect the scalp to the to the intracranial um vasculature right or it connects it to the meningitis the meninges sorry so what it can do the emissary veins can take whatever infection is it is found in the loose areola layer right and then they can take it to the meninges and then where it will cause meningitis so it it's easier for it to pass whatever whether infection or pass but most of the time it's infection and pass it will pass it from the loose areola all the way to your um your meninges resulting in meningitis which is not good guys so that is the reason why it is the dangerous area of the scalp are we clear i'll show you what where do we find the misery veins and everything and then lastly we have the periosteum the periosteum is often referred to as the 
pericranium. So whether you say pericranium, periosteum, one is the same thing, right? So what this is, is the outer bone of the skull, right? So it's the outer bone of the skull. And then when it gets to the sutures, you know the sutures are the lines in, in the skull, in the skull, sorry, that connect the bones. So when it gets to the sutures, um, it, it binds with the endosteum, but we are not there today. But just for you to understand what we are talking about. So guys, to quickly explain what I was talking about, the emissary veins and the emissary veins and everything. Um, sorry, okay, yeah. So if we were, if you were to focus here, because I want to show you something. Yeah, awesome. If you were to, this here, you can see the, this triangular thing, this would be your superior sagittal sinus. You still remember your dural venous sinuses, right? So this is the section of the, of the head if we were to take a coronal section. This would be your parietal bone, right? So if we were to take the coronal section, this is what we would see. And from just taking that, we know that here, we have our superior sagittal sinus. Then we have our pulse cerebri, and then down somewhere there, we have our inferior sagittal sinus. But this diagram is only so showing you the superior sagittal sinus, which is this triangular thing here. And then for orientation, this is the skin. Um, you can see the epidermis and the dermis layer, right? And even the connective tissue, but they didn't distinguish between the epidermis and the dermis. So that, that is the skin. And then you have your connective tissue, and then you have your epicranial aponeurosis as it is pointed there. You have your loose areola connective tissue and your periosteum. And then this bone, in, in this case, we can be more specific to say it is the parietal bone, right? So this parietal bone, if you can check here, you have this spongy bone in between. We call that the diplo, ne? D I P L O E. I know you know that. I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's diplo, right? So this top part of the parietal bone, this top part is the outer table of the parietal bone. Then the, this inner part here is the inner table of the parietal bone. So you have the outer table of the parietal bone, the inner table of the parietal bone, and in between you have what? The deep floor, right? So what you have is veins that are from, let me use a different color. You have veins that are from the superior sagittal sinus, right? From the superior sagittal sinus, and then they go in inside the the diploid. Then we call them the diploid veins. And then you have veins that continue to they they can get to the um connective tissue. But we are more interested. These are here at this level we call them emissary veins. Here, these ones that are going horizontal is diploid veins, right? So you, you, the purpose of the emissary veins is that they connect the scalp to the brain itself. Are we clear? That is simple, guys. That is pretty, pretty simple to understand. And then here we have the we have the jura meter. Check this green color. Here. We have the jura meter, right? The jura meter, just remember depth. So depth is for what? It's for your jura meter, your um, arachnoid meter, and your, your pyre meter. So you have your jura meter, and your jura meter, remember that it has two layers, your endospial and meningeal, but that is not important in this case. And then you have your arachnoid matter, right? And then you have your arachnoid granulations and everything. 
and then you have the subarachnoid space, right? Subarachnoid space before even your, your pyometer here. This is your pyometer here, right? This would be your cerebral artery. Are we clear? But what you have to understand from what I just told you so far is where do we find the dangerous area and what's the importance of the emissary veins and understand this basic diagram here. Once you understand this basic diagram, you're good to go because this is simple. It's very, very easy. And um, to continue, that will be it for, for, for layers, right? For the layers of the scalp. I hope you understood everything. Here. And then going further to the arterial supply of the scalp, I drew a little diagram here on the bottom left, right? You can check it. Um, I'm not good at drawing, but I tried, guys. This is just a schematic diagram to try and explain in simplest ways um, the arterial supply of the scalp, right? And it will be easier for you if you understand everything, every single thing we are going to deal with here. It will be easier for you to understand when we are going to the anterior phase. And the head in general, it will be easier for you to understand because some of the blood vessels and the, the nerves and everything, we are still going to discuss them. So going to that um, diagram, the, uh, this ugly person of mine I drew here, we can see two colors, the green one and the red one. So what I tried to do, guys, the red one represents the intern internal carotid artery. Then the green one represents the, ah, the, the green one represents the internal carotid artery. And the red one represents the external carotid artery. And then at this level from, let me make it black. Here, this black colored one, is the common carotid artery. We know that before it divides, um, after it divides um, along the, the first portion of the internal carotid artery is called the carotid sinus. And now we know that it is the carotid, the baroreceptors for blood pressure and everything. We are going to discuss that um, when we do the anterior piece. For now, that, that, that has nothing to do with the scalp, but that is what you have to know. Surely you know it by now. So why, you, you, why am, I, am I telling about the carotid arteries whereas we are only dealing with the scalp and until you get porous of the scalp, that it's this region here. It's important for you, there's no way you would understand the, the arterial supply because you'll end up creamy, which is not the way to go about when it comes to anatomy. So these dotted arteries, I have about five dotted arteries. Those are the only ones that supply the scalp. The rest, they don't supply the scalp. Are we clear? Though the, the ones that are dotted, you can check these ones, about five of them. Those are the only ones that supply the scalp. Are we clear, guys? Awesome. So if we can check on, up, on, on this five dotted, arteries, only two are from the internal carotid artery. These two, only these two are from the internal carotid artery. And those are the supratrochlear and the supraorbital arteries. Those are the only ones. And the difference between the supratrochlear and the supraorbital, because people tend to confuse them, is that the supraorbital is more anteromedial. It's anteromedial. And then the supratrochlear is anterolateral. It can go to as much as the lambdoid suture, if you know where the lambdoid suture is. It can go to that level, it can extend to that level. As, as, if you, can, as you can see on my top right corner, bottom right, I mean to say, the one, you have two. This shorter one here will be your supraorbital. The longer one will be your supratrochlear. Always the longer one that extends to the level of the vertex. This level here, this bouncy thing here, we call it the vertex. That goes to the vertex. That is your supratrochlear. I hope it makes sense, guys. This is easy. Anatomy is easy. Don't make it difficult. It's simple, 
simple, simple. All it requires, you understand, you repeat. You understand, you repeat. As simple as that. Try to make things easier. Don't cram the diagrams, right? So with that being said, only these two are from the internal carotid artery. Then the remaining three are from the external carotid artery. And the external carotid artery, it has about eight, branch, eight branches all in all. You have to know all the eight. But for the scalp, for the arterial supply of the scalp, you just have to know three, right? So I'll, I'll give you all the eight branches because you, we are going to do all three, eight branches when we're going to the anterior phase, right? And especially when we are going to do the, the neck. So if you understand it and you grasp it now, it will be easier for you to follow when we do the next um, upcoming lessons. Are we clear? Awesome. So without wasting time, I said we have eight branches of the external carotid artery. And the simplest way to remember them is by using a mnemonic to say some anatomist like freaking out poor medical students. Are we clear? So if you didn't get it, let me know in the comment below. I'll write it down for you. Some anatomists like freaking out poor medical students. So that gives you about eight letters. You take the first letter of each word. You have eight letters. So they go in that order, guys. They go in that order. We start from the inferior going superior, right? So some, that's S, right? That's for your superior thyroid artery. That is not important for me. Then the A is going backward, right? And notice the direction because some are going anterior, some are going posteriorly and everything. You, you just don't know the names. You, you must know. We'll discuss the origins and their parts when we go to the anterior phase, right? But for now, just know that the S is the superior thyroid artery. You have the ascending pharyngeal artery. You have the lingual artery. You have the facial artery. You have the occipital. So the occipital, I put, I, I put a dot there. So meaning the occipital artery supplies the scalp, right? And then you have the posterior auricule. Posterior auricule, it also supplies the scalp, right? Then you have your maxillary. Maxillary for now, it's not important. Then you have your superficial temporal artery. So meaning the only ones that are important for now, for now, it's your occipital, your posterior auricular, and your superficial temporal artery. And you would include your supratrochlea and your supraorbital arteries. Simple. Once you know the arteries, it will be easier for you to know the, the veins and the nerves as well. This is easy, guys. It's anatomy is simple. Are we clear? So without wasting time, that will be it for the arterial supply. And once you know this diagram, this stinky diagram of mine here, it will be easier for you to know which areas they supply. As you can see, the occipital artery, occipital, why occipital? Because it supplies the region, the occipital region, right? So this supplies the occipital region, it's self-explanatory. The posterior auricular, auricular means the ear, so it's behind the ear, right? Supplies the area that is just behind the ear, are we clear? And then the superficial temporal, superficial temporal, it supplies the temporal region, but only the superficial part of it, right? It doesn't go deep. And then the supraorbital and the supratrochlea, I explained to you to say that the supraorbital is more anteromedial to the frontal bone, and then the supratrochlea is anterolateral. It can go to the, um, as much as, um, to the lambric switch. Here, that is simple, guys. That will be it for the arterial supply. So going to the venous um, drainage, Venous drainage is more like what drains it. So here we are talking about veins, right? So the venous drainage of the scalp is divided into two. We have the superficial drainages. You can see there, and then we have the deep um, drainage, right? So the superficial drainage is the same as the, once you know the arterial supply, you know what the superficial drainage, right? So what do I mean? It means that the superficial drainage, you have the supraorbital vein, the supratrochlear vein, the, super, um, the superior, the superficial temporal vein, and the posterior auricular vein and the occipital vein. 
they are the same names as the arteries. You just change the artery to be those are your superficial. Um, that is your superficial drainage. Sorry, and then going to your deep drainage. Your deep drainage is your pterygoid plexus, right? So remember that um, the plexus is what. When you hear the word plexus, you think of a network. It's just a network. In this case, it will be a network of veins, right? So your pterygoid. Do we know of the word? Have you heard of the word pterygoid before? Yes, because you, you've studied this section. If you haven't, we are going to do it. Don't worry. When you're doing the anterior phase. So you you you've heard of what is called the lateral pterygoid muscles and the medial pterygoid muscles. So it means if we say the pterygoid plexus, we, we expect to find it at that region of the pterygoid muscles, right? So the pterygoid plexus is found between the temporalis muscle and the lateral pterygoid muscle to be specific, not the mid, right? So to be specific, it's between the temporalis and the lateral pterygoid muscle. Are we clear? So if you can check, I put a, a picture there. This um, yellow highlighted area, that is your pterygoid plexus, right? And it drains into the maxillary. I've, lab I've labeled the veins one to six. The number one, the number one is the maxillary vein. So this venous plex, ah, not venous, Jesus. This pterygoid plexus will drain into the maxillary vein, right? And then it will form what we call the retromandibular vein, which is this number two here. And then we are going to explain when we're doing the anterior phase again how it forms the, the retromandibular vein and everything. And as I said, guys, anatomy is not difficult at all. What you have to do, break it down and repeat something until you understand it, right? There's no special tricky. If you don't study, but I'm going to, I can assure you if you can study and watch my lessons, or just watch my lessons before study. By the time you study, it will be easier for you to understand these things. So let me know in the comment below if you really like my learning style. Because this is what is not what I'm going to do every day. It depends on the chapter that we're doing. And I'll try by all means to make it as simple as I can. Because I can't teach you using PowerPoint presentation. For me, it's useless. Right? So that will be number two will be your retromandibular vein. Number three will be your internal jugular vein, right? Number four will be your facial vein. Facial vein, the, the thing about the facial vein, you always um, the simplest way to know if it's a facial vein, it goes, it curves around the, the mandible, at the angle of the mandible. That's the easiest way. You see a vein or an artery that is just caving. It's like it was hidden before and then suddenly just comes above the angle of the mandible. That's your facia. Done. And then number five, that's your deep facial vein. Is it difference between the facial vein and deep facial vein, right? Then six, we said is there. Pterygoid plexus, done. So you are done with the venous drainage. You know now that we have the superficial drainage and the deep drainage. Easy, guys. I'm going to the last say, um, section is the innervation. We're not talking about innervation, we are talking about nerve supply, right? So the nerve supply of the skull is also, I can also divide it into two to make it easier for you. We have the trigeminal tri nerve and the cervical nerves. Right. So if we come to the diagram that I um, put there for you, right, we can see. Um, let me try to do this so it will be easier for you to understand. We can see, I don't know if you can see the line I'm drawing. Yes. Yeah, you can see, see that rainbow line that I'm busy drawing. You take that line, you divide the head into two. The, Anterior part from that line is what is supplied. The is supplied by the trigeminal nerve, meaning the innervation is from the trigeminal nerve. And then the posterior one, the innervation is from the cervical nerves. Easy. Don't break your head. Easy. Easy. And then from there, what you have to understand is that we you know by now that the trigeminal nerve has how many divisions? 
three, you have your ophthalmic, you have your maxillary, and you have your mandibular. We are going to explain, and I'll give you an easier way when I'm going to do anterior face and everything, and how to remember those and everything. You don't have to cram because you have to understand, right? And I'll give you simplest way, ways to understand. But scalp is the easiest. Scalp is the easiest. You have to understand this, guys. Um, so your V1, as I said, is your ophthalmic, your V2 is your maxillary, and your V3 is your mandibule, right? So as you can see that um, your V1, the nerve supply will be there going back to this kinky person. Um, it will be a supratrochlear nerve and a supraorbital nerve. Done, simple as that. And there from there, this common, um, they branch from the ophthalmic artery. Obviously, it's not shown here in this diagram, but it's there on this um, funny diagram of my here, right? So, meaning you have about eight nerves for the innervation of the scalp. The first two from the ophthalmic division is what? Is your supratrochlear and your supraorbital nerves, right? So, done with those. And then go into your maxillary division. You have your zygomaticotemporal nerve. Zygomaticotemporal nerve, which one is that one? It's this one. Your zygomaticotemporal nerve, it's self explanatory. Zygome, zygo from the zygo, zygomatic bone, temporal from the temporal bone, then you join those two. So what it supplies, it supplies the temple. What is the temple? It's this area here. We can't say it supplies the temporal bone because the temporal bone is the whole of that. So it supplies the temple, right? It's that area here. So from your mandibular division, you have your auriculotemporal, auriculotemporal. So auriculotemporal supplies what? The area that is antero superior, antero superior, antero superior, ne? So that means anterior to the ear, and then you just go superior, then it supplies that region, the anterior region and the superior region. That is your auriculotemporal. So those are the first four, right? The supratrochlea, the supraorbital, your zygomaticotemporal, which is from the maxillary division, and your auriculotemporal, which is from the mandibular division. Simple. And then the remaining four are from the spinal, not the spinal, the spinal nerves, yes, but to be precise, the cervical nerves. Some, some test to say spinal nerves, cervical nerves, because they are around the region of the neck, right? And for these ones, you have to know the root values, right? Where do they where do we originate from, if it makes sense. So if you can check, you have a green, green shaded area and this orange shaded area. So the ones that are from this orange shaded area, anteriorly, they are from the ventral rama. The ones that are in this green shaded area, those are in or are from the posterior rama. This is posterior to this, so guys, this is simple. I, anatomy is simple, guys. Don't create your head for nothing. This is posterior rami, anterior rama. Simple, right? So we will have two nerves from the ventral rami, two nerves from the posterior rami. Then we have four. Then the four we just named plus this four is your eight. And you just saw how the first four we named was easier, and it's easier for you to look at. I mean, it's just there in front of you. You look at it, even if the diagram is not there, you just close your eyes, you see these things, right? So the first one we have is the lesser occipital, right? So your lesser occipital is from one, from C2, is from C2. I, will, I don't know if we will have time, but as I said, I don't want to keep this video very long. But if we have time, I'll draw a schematic diagram for you to make it easier for you to remember the, the root values. You don't have to cramp because we're going to study a lot of 
good views. This year, not just about from head and neck, from everything we're going to do. So it will be easier for you if you know and you combine everything, right? You don't have to cram, remember. So Alessa occipital is from C2, right? And it's from the anterior rama. So they, they are both, the ones on the anterior rama and the ones from the posterior rama, they both found on the dorsal root of the spinal nerve, if you still remember. But when they exit, they exit, the other one exits posteriorly, the other one exits anteriorly. That's the only difference. That's where the anterior rama and posterior rama comes from. There's nothing special. So this is your lesser occipital from the anterior rama, specifically C2, level of C2, right? And then you have the great auricula. The great auricula is from anterior rami. The levels or root, the root levels is C2 and C3. Going to the posterior rama, you have your greater occipital, which is also from C2, right? And then there's one that is not drawn here. Uh, if I were to draw it for you, it would be around that region. There. That would be your third occipital, third occipital nerve, right? So the third occipital nerve is from self-explanatory. It's from the third root value, C3, right? So it's simple. So we have all those. So you have your two from anterior, which is less occipital and great auricular. And then you have your greater occipital and your third occipital. This one is from C2. This one is from C3. This is one is from C2, sorry. That one is from C2 and C3. And this one, is, this V1, V2, and V3, I told you, it's just the divisions of the cranial nerve um, number five. So once you see those Vs, it's cranial nerve number five. So with that being said, guys, that's it for the skull. That is everything you have to know for the skull. It is as simple as that. It is as simple as that. So if I were to, sorry for that. If I were to explain, um, sorry. So with that being it for today's lesson, I said if we have time, I would explain, um, but I feel like explaining this will somehow, but it don't confuse you guys, because I said if we grasp, you grasp everything that you're going to do here, it will be easier for you to fall. Because head and neck is difficult for most of the people they are complaining. See, but I'm, I want to make it easier for you. I want to make anatomy as a whole a little bit more easy. So let's say you have our C1 there, that is our vertebral. Um, yeah, it's our vertebral. You forgive me for my drawing. So that is our C1, that is our C2, C3, C4, C5, right? And these are connected, they are connected. So they are connected like that. They have loops. This, this is the di simplest diagram, sorry. They are connected like, yeah. yeah. So this is your C1 your C2, your C3, your C4, your C5, right? And then from, from C1, um, obviously at this level, these are your cervical plexus. Yeah, to make it easier for you to, once you understand the cervical plexus, it will be easier for you to understand everything I'm going to do on here and make it this easier for you guys. Easy. I'm going to, this, to do this diagram again when you're doing interior things and everything. But just to make it easier for you, you'd have something like that, right? Those are your C1 fibers. So C1 fibers. They would join with the ones from the 12th cranial nerve with you, which is your hypoglossal. So if I were to draw somewhere, they don't precisely join, 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 but close, right? But there are some fibers of the hypoglossal that we find in the C1 group. Right, 
so we would have leave your cranial nerve number 12 right which is your hypoglossal and at this level somewhere there you would have your cranial nerve number 11 which is your accessory right awesome and then from there this c1 root along with hypoglossa they will supply your genio hyoid muscle you are going to do this then your thyro hyoid muscle but we are not there today i just want to show you how we get to this um how you can sorry um get this c2 and c3 everything right so let me leave those for now because there's a lot to do um this is c1 c2 at the level of c2 we said we have the lesser occipital lesser occipital lesser occipital your lo your lesser occipital is from c2 right and between c2 and c3 i said we have i'll throw it in green we have our great auricule from between c2 and c3 do you now understand why c2 and c3 awesome and then this is your great auricular give me for my bad handwriting great auricular and then from there we said we have greater occipital but here we are just showing the ventral room so if meaning you, you also have your greater occipital from c2 here just like the lesser occipital and your third occipital is from c3 mainly from there then you will have you will also have your transverse um cervical which is also from c2 c3 right and your supraclavicular which is from c3 we are going to do those later on for now once you and what I'm, I'm trying to to say is that once you can understand this diagram of which i'm going to explain it clearly when you are doing the anterior phase because right now i don't want to include things that we haven't touched it because if i were to explain the whole diagram just like now the junior hyoid because it also includes the answer cervicalis and the whole of the infrahyoid muscles it's it's just too overwhelming and i don't want to confuse you guys the aim of this channel is to make anatomy a little bit easier and for for yeah a little bit easier to for you to understand so if there's something you didn't understand let me know in the comment below if you enjoyed this lesson and you did understand hit the subscribe the subscribe button and the like button i really appreciate it guys and yeah tell your friends about it if you did understand and let me know what is it did, you didn't understand and i'll try to clarify it on the next lesson right guys so with that being said because i said i don't want the video to be too long with that being said that will be it for today so that is it that is what you know you have to know for the scalp you have to know the borders the layers the arterial supply venous supply and the innovation then once you know that you are done and then the only um um medical concepts here or medical applications you have to know you have to know the dangerous area and why it is it a dangerous area you have to know why why the scalp is the area that uplifts profusely that is it for now you see the scalp is less so the trick with anatomy you have to master things why they are still at their basic level because every single thing that you're doing here by the time we get to anterior phase i expect you to know these things so i won't be explaining some of the things here are we clear guys so yeah i'll explain some but i won't go into much detail because i did for some of the things you have to know your emissary veins you have to know your diploid veins how they connect and where we where they are found and everything and then that is it guys from me and with that being said don't wait for the workload to buckle up study the scalp now use this video before study just check this video and go to your textbook for more information if there's something you didn't understand come back to me i'll try by all means to make it a little bit easier for you and yeah guys that is it like don't don't complicate life that is it and then with by so doing you'll be studying less and studying smart at the same time studying a lot of time or spending a lot of hours in front of your book or your laptop doesn't mean you're getting what you're studying right i know we have different study methods and everything 
but just know your learning style firstly and then utilize it right know your learning style utilize it stick to it um if someone is doing whatever and don't don't be a copycat when it comes to the, these things of learning styles stick to your learning style you you now know your learning style stick to it and yeah guys study your own way but what i can tell you is take regular breaks in between and studying for five hours doesn't mean you understand what you're doing this is not mathematics or physics or by your practice this is theory so you have to know these weights and concepts and understand you just don't knowing that this is a skin and this is the exterior the external carotid artery doesn't mean you know anatomy right you don't know you just know how to live of which is someone everyone can do that we can all cram but the moment you understand the course the moment you understand what happens if that artery or that vein is cut the moment you understand the complications and everything then we can you can claim to know anatomy and remember one thing that this is not a competition and we are here to help one another so if there's something um, i'm not saying that i know everything but i'll try by all means to explain everything to you and make it easier for you and to and i'll try by all means to after each and every session or after each and every block to have sort of like a revision lesson of um questions that um normally asked or the possible questions that you might be asked so yeah guys um stay safe stay home and study keep your mind active and yeah that's it from me signing out see you on the next lesson which will be the anterior phase so let me know what you think of this lesson on the comment below love you guys but god loves you more